So blogging has changed so much in the last few years. And you know, it can be kind of scary running an entire online business and being reliant on the Google algorithm and whatever they decide to do, right? So blogging to me, it's a lot like steering a cruise ship. So the more content you put out there, the more articles you have on your website, the longer it takes to turn the ship, right? It just takes a while. So we need to adapt fast. So that's why in this video, I'm covering some of the top things you need to know before you even think about starting a blogging business for yourself, some reasons maybe why you shouldn't start one, and if you already have one, some quick pivots you can make to get traffic and revenue back to where you want it to be. Now, if you wanna learn how we're building these profitable online businesses in 2024, make sure to click the link in the description below, put in your email, and I'll give you access to exactly how we're doing that, so all the resources so you can get started for yourself once and for all, so let's get into it. What I'm looking at here is the 16 companies dominating the world's Google search results. So we can see a lot of different ones here, like if we go down to Red Ventures, there's things like CNET, creditcards.com, Healthline, right? Huge sites that we're looking at here. Or something like Ziff Davis, they have IGN, PC Mag, some of these really big ones, right? So they buy out some middle-sized uh, middle blogs and then they scale them. So what they do is they get their process behind them, like having a lot more writers, a lot more content, and just scaling the efforts. So this has been true for a long time, but Google is kind of favoring some of these media sites, right? We see Forbes ranking for a lot of stuff. We also, if we look at like Reddit, look at Reddit's uh, traffic and Ahrefs, right? We look at, it was at like 78 million, now we're at 481 million. And these are all estimates, obviously, but we can see, what is Google doing? Well, they're, they're, we're in this new world of AI and content and what is Google doing? Well, they're being kind of reactionary to bloggers. They're saying, we're gonna reward big media sites because we can trust them based on their link authority. Uh, and then we're gonna also trust human content. So like Reddit, they're looking at it as, well, if there's a review on a product or information on a product, maybe Reddit has better unbiased information because it's user generated, right? So it makes it a little bit more difficult but not impossible to rank content right now. But we kind of have to understand this world of a little bit faster publishing velocity. And then we have to avoid certain niches and certain like really competitive ones that we just probably shouldn't get in. So for example, if you wanted to start a blog today in the health and wellness space, talking about you know things that are like related to health, like the best supplements and the best things that you put in your body and things like that, it's gonna be really hard because we're gonna be going up against Healthline and these big media sites that you know some of these niches just require a lot more authority and expertise. They have people like doctors writing them and things like that. So the question then is, what do we write, right? How do we find opportunities? So let's look at some examples of like really competitive searches. We have best supplements for inflammation. Random search I just came up with, but we have Healthline, WebMD, Forbes, and then a medical center, Amazon, medical stuff, US Weekly, Good Housekeeping, and the Arthritis Foundation. Not really a good chance there. What about something for business, like best business credit cards for travel? That's a long tail keyword. Well, let's look at that. Well, we have ads, then we have NerdWallet, huge site, Forbes, USA Today, CNBC, Wallet Hub, Bank of America, American Express, you get the point. Uh, same thing is true of like best CRM software. There's ads and then there's Zapier, Forbes, PC Mag, Zapier again, Trust Radius, USA Today and things like that. And then we have like VPNs, CNET, security.org, Tom's Guide, CNET, you get the point, right? So we just have to know like, okay, if the internet's been around and Google's been around for 20 plus years, and there's a lot of sites that have been writing about this content, like something like a VPN, I don't know when they were invented, but it was probably a while ago, right? Or something like supplements, like big media sites have been writing about it for a while. So don't jump on the bandwagon 20 years late with a small blog, right? It just doesn't make sense. So we have to kind of know that, yes, there are some areas that are too competitive, right? That we shouldn't get into. If you're struggling and you have a health site or a, you know, a finance site that's not doing well, there's areas you can pivot into. So we have to just know how to look for things that are saturated to find things that are not. Speaking of making money with your website, today's video is brought to you by WPX. So if you're a blogger or you plan to sell digital products online, you're gonna need a good shopping cart. So WPX has created custom hosting plans specifically for websites that use the WordPress WooCommerce shopping cart. And they have three new plans to choose from. So those are PowerStore, Superstore, and Hyperstore. Now they're all boosted 
with all the needed resources for a faster, better performing, and super secure online store. And these are all custom managed WooCommerce hosting plans boosted with more resources for better performance so you can sleep easy knowing your site will stay up when you get that spike in traffic. Plus WPX support is literally the best in the business with a 30 second average response rate. So really fast. Now make sure to click the WPX link in the description for more information on WPX hosting. Another thing we have to think about is just having the wrong type of content because Google has had helpful content updates, product review updates, the algorithm has changed. Um, certain sites have gone up, certain sites have gone down. But what I've learned is, and what I think uh, has happened is, things that were already competitive got more competitive. Things that weren't competitive didn't really get more competitive. So what I mean by that is don't punch above your weight, right? So I was punching above my weight for a while and I ranked for four plus years for best podcast hosting. Right? I made about six to $10,000 a month, every month for four years with that article. I still am because it's recurring affiliate commissions. But does it really make sense for my site, which has maybe five or six articles on podcasting to rank number one for podcast hosting? Not necessarily, it did three years ago when I was building links to it and updating the content, adding videos and stuff like that. But today it's more about topical authority. Right, so that just got a lot more competitive. So if we look at it today, best podcast hosting, um, 89 difficulty, really hard. You can even see the search volumes going down, right? People were probably more interested in starting podcasts with hosting back in 2018, 2019. Um, we can see the volatility of the search results, but then we see, you know, there's a podcast hosting, a software company, Reddit, soft a hosting company, Apple, TechRadar, big media site, um, other sites, podcast host. So one blog in there, but their DR is 75. So we just see like, where am I now, right? At, um, if I search for it, I'm 25. I'm still above Wix, which is really good, right? I'm still above Podcast Insights, which they were number one for years too. Uh, number one to two, we were always kind of switching back and forth for years, Podcast Insights and I. So I'm still above Wix, which is cool, but like Wix probably shouldn't be ranking for that. It doesn't really make sense either, right? So what became you know, what already was competitive got a lot more competitive. So we see that with sites that were ranking for things like GoDaddy login or certain website builder terms or just these, these niche middle tier blogs that were ranking for a lot of really difficult stuff and they were being propped up by really good link building and really good content. What happened is Google says, no, we actually, you know, you probably shouldn't be ranking for that. So we're gonna trust big media sites, the companies that are actually, you know, doing it themselves. So best website builder would be Wix, Squarespace, maybe Shopify, Forbes. That's about it, right? So software companies kind of got up to speed and started creating these articles themselves. Big media sites did, Google shifted things. Everyone got, you know, all the mid-tier bloggers in the DR 60 to 75, 80 range got kind of pushed down to page two or three, Reddit got up. So it kind of happened across the board with competitive stuff. Good news is most beginner bloggers aren't worrying about ranking for ultra competitive things in the first place anyways, right? So what was competitive got more competitive, but the good news is what wasn't competitive didn't really get much more competitive. So let me show you an example of that. So here's an example of a site doing really well, and that's nichepursuits.com. So a lot of you probably know this guy, Spencer Hawes. He's a cool guy, he's doing well. Um, his site's looking good, right? And it's like, so what is he doing? What is he doing differently than somebody trying to rank for podcast hosting or CRMs or website builders or things that are can make a ton of money, but are a little bit competitive these days. Well, if we look at his top pages, we can see that he's found his informational pocket of opportunity. So he's going after things that are easier to rank for, right? Names, boutique names, farm names, newspaper names, cafe names, parlor names. So he's found that pocket of opportunity where he's like, I'm gonna do all business names and I'm gonna write all of them. I'm gonna build topical authority across the board for all of them and they're easier to rank for. The difficulty is a lot lower. Right, the keyword difficulty is they're not risky to the reader, they're just ideas, right? So that's kind of where we've seen success in kind of revamping a strategy is just go after simpler, easier things, right? The days of competing with Forbes like I was before might be a little bit more difficult now. So the question is, Adam, do I just only create informational, easy, simple, long tail content that doesn't make me much money? Well, there's different ways we can we can frame it, right? And that's not always the case. I mean, there's just different ways to think about it. So look at this site, outdoorgearlab.com. 
There's actually some interesting YouTube videos on the strategy that they're using, but this site is doing relatively well. They've had some dips, but they're doing well overall. And if we look at their top pages, this is a almost 100% transactional site, all types of transactional posts for affiliate revenue, right? Camping, coolers, water bottles, electric bikes, running shoes. There's not, to my knowledge, like a ton of, uh, there probably is a lot of informational content, but it's mostly transactional. So they're doing really well with that. But what they did is they have really good formatting. So they have the same formatting in every article where they have a solid introduction, all the internal links right here, editor's notes, and then they have their product rating graphs. And these are all the same across their multiple websites and properties, but it looks really good. It's easy to navigate. So they're doing well and they, you know, this is how you do well at affiliate marketing, but what they do have is topical authority. I mean, they've covered every product, right? So they're winning with raw topical authority. So you don't, have to necessarily just focus on simple, easy informational keywords. But what we need to know is that topical authority is really important. For example, if you're in like the baby niche or something like that, you can just put best baby into the keyword explorer and try to find all these transactional keywords. And you can see, yeah, there's 34,000 of them, right? So there's a lot of them and a lot of them are pretty easy to rank for. Keyword difficulty of one for best baby carrier, wipes, books, bouncer, there's lots of baby products. Trust me, my wife's pregnant right now and uh, seeing all the crazy expensive products is a little bit interesting, but you know, you can do both. You can have transactional and informational content, but what's the right ratio? Well, I think that it is becoming more difficult to create something like the Outdoor Gear Lab did where it's just like, I'm gonna write reviews on everything. You have to have really good like layouts for that. Sometimes you have to write a ton of content and it's just, might be getting more and more difficult. But what you can do is spot your pocket of informational content opportunity, and that's a little bit different in every niche, and there's no perfect seed phrase to find it, right? So how do we find these unlimited high volume keywords in my niche that I can rank for that are easy? Well, it's not you know the easiest thing to find. If it was, everyone would be doing it, but it's not hard either, and it's just niche dependent. So for example, something like ideas posts, I've talked about it before, but they can be good because they're searched for a ton. There's a ton of search volume. And then if we drop the difficulty down to like five, we can start to see, all right, what types of ideas posts are easy, like painting, drawing. So if you wanna write about drawing and painting and art, uh, lots of really good opportunities there for drawing and art ideas. Or maybe you're a writer and you put in the word examples and then you find all these easier keywords to rank for around superlatives and inferences and whatever all these fancy words from language arts class were. Or if you're into fitness, look up workouts, drop the difficulty down and you can see lots of these random longer tail workouts, right? Back cable, tricep cable, chest cable, back with cable, all kinds of cable things apparently, but there's lots of opportunities there. And of course my favorite, the recipes, if you're a food blogger, we can go back to our, my favorite example, shiny sandwich recipes, because I need to eat food only if it's shiny. So a good thing to do is find the seed phrase that you want to use within your niche and try to find like a hundred articles. Now you're not gonna write them all at once, obviously, but you need a lot of them. So you might as well dominate topical authority. And then it's just easy at that point. A lot of these uh, informational articles are super easy to write too and a lot faster. So you can publish and increase the publishing velocity on these and realize like, okay, there's a hundred articles I'm gonna write about business names or a certain type of example or idea or workout or recipe or something like that. So you can find a hundred informational articles to write that are not competitive. Forbes isn't in there. Like Reddit's not in there, right? You don't have to worry about that. They don't even care about it. Um, and then you can also find the easy transactional content. So within that niche, also look for best plus product terms um, in that niche to find like 20 to 30 of those. And then you have an entire blog content plan mapped out that actually will work. Another reason maybe you shouldn't start a blog is if you're expecting to rely 100% on organic Google traffic to make affiliate revenue. So you can do it. You can do it in a lot, of, a lot of lower competition niches like outdoor products, hobbies, and things like that. But diversifying traffic sources and using social media is becoming more and more important. Like social media views and shares and things like that are even becoming some type of ranking factor on Google. So a blog, you know, just by itself, only reliant on Google, it's just a little bit risky. Like businesses need diversification. One of the reasons I started my YouTube channel because I didn't want to rely only on Google traffic, right? So, you know, you have to think about diversifying traffic sources and 
only relying on affiliate marketing can be kind of tough. We want to diversify different revenue streams. So we want to be able to have those easy info, informational content for like ad revenue, building your email list, some of the transactional posts for affiliate revenue. And then we can choose that secondary you know, platform to diversify on based on your personality and the niche that you're in. So for example, if you're a little extroverted and you're talking about gaming, people are probably, you know, your audience is on YouTube. If your uh, blog is about fashion, you could do Pinterest. If it's cooking or you know, food stuff, it could be Instagram or tattoos would be Instagram. If it's software, it's probably a LinkedIn strategy. Right, so we can build traffic, not just from only organic Google traffic, but also a secondary traffic source. So here's exactly what I would do right now. Even if you haven't started a blog yet, you're thinking about it, or if you have a blog with articles and you're looking to pivot and move into something that'll work a little bit better. So first, you have to build a business and create informational content in your niche. Right, find the seed phrase, find the easy thing. Again, this goes back to selecting the right niche based on the brand of you, a personal brand based on your expertise, the market, keyword research, and all of those things that we teach in Blog Growth Engine. But what you can do with all this info content, what's nice is you can build your email list. So when you're talking about different, you know, if you're ranking for those name ideas, right? Or even if you're doing workouts, if you're ranking for a lot of easy workouts, don't focus only on ad revenue. Like use a tool like ConvertBox and get entrance intent or exit intent pop-ups to appear on every single visitor. So they see that and they say, here, do you want 10 free workouts from me? Enter your email address. Or hey, do you want my favorite 50 business names or my 10 step ways to start a business? Enter your email address. So you match a lead magnet to it. And then we're going from algorithm to ownership because that's what we need to do to build a real business. We need to get traffic and views and attention from the algorithm and then we funnel that into making money. Now we used to, you know, it was a lot easier in the past maybe to only focus on affiliate revenue or just ads, but to build a diversified business, we need all of it. So we wanna have ad revenue, affiliate revenue, and then you should also, you know, build up that email list over time with no product yet to sell, right? But if we're teaching in a niche, if we're teaching different things, which blogs pretty much are that, right? Teaching how to do stuff and the products to use, then we can, build the email list in the background while we're thinking about, well, what product do we want to create? So we're going to go after lower risk keywords that are not as competitive and then blanket topical authority. So this is the key part. You can't just go after some easy keywords, but go a little bit over here and a little bit over there. And I'm going to talk about the best bench press machines. And then I'm going to talk about supplements and protein powder. It's just too broad, right? So we want to go deep on a specific topic and just blanket topical authority so that you're like out of all the blogs out there, you're number one, or at least in the top two or three with the most content on that specific sub niche. I also want you to think about having an eventual product to sell. So something like a course. So how do you build that email list up and then get it, survey your customers or your leads, I mean, uh, send them emails, ask them what their pain points are in your niche, and then build some type of informational product. So it's all about building trust with your audience, building a true personal brand. So blogging is always the first path because everyone needs a website, right? Even if you have a YouTube channel, you probably still wanna have a website. Or an Instagram, you have to send people to a website. To make money, you need people to go to your website usually, right? So it's always the good first business to start. And then you can think about diversifying your traffic sources over time, right? You don't have to worry about this right away but it's just good to do that based on, again, your personality and the niche. So overall, to make money, you need to have monetization planned from day one, you need a full strategy. So if you wanna learn again how we're building these profitable online businesses in 2024, make sure to click the link in the description below, sign up for that, we'll give you all the free resources so you can get started once and for all, because a lot of times it's like, what niche do I choose, right? There's lots of roadblocks along the way. So we're here to help you. If you have any questions or comments, uh, I do my best to answer them. I, tr you know, I don't answer every comment, but I, I do try to answer the ones that are really good questions that'll help everybody out. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like it, thumbs up the video, hit the notification bell, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Check out my other videos on blogging, affiliate marketing, all different ways to make money online. And I'll see you in the next video. And also, some days you just wake up and you don't really wanna do your hair, you know? So you, you just do this, you wake up in the morning and you don't take a shower and you just flip it up and you know, you just accept it. You put yourself on the internet, which I was kind of scared of doing a few years ago, but now it's fine. So thank you for watching. I'll talk to you soon.